Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, especially next to Dr. Dinault, presenting our latest developments on RV monitoring. Um, so these are my disclosures. All right, so now we know the importance of monitoring right ventricular function from the presentation from Dr. Dinault. And my goal for today's presentation is to walk you through a novel and very exciting um, catheter. We call it the Swangans IQ catheter, as well as the three main algorithms that goes with that catheter. Um, and with the, hope, with the hope to help you assess right ventricular function at the bedside. So Dr. Dinol briefly introduced the Swangans IQ catheter. And the current catheters that we have, they allow you to measure the central venous pressure and the pulmonary artery pressure, but not the right ventricular pressure waveform. And um, there, are, there is a, a, a catheter that has been used. Um, it was mainly that, uh, designed for um, pacing, and it has a lumen around 19 centimeters distal from the tip of the catheter. And that lumen has been used for monitoring the right ventricular pressure waveform at different institutions. And the problem with that catheter is that, as Dr. Dinal mentioned, um, around 10% of the cases it doesn't work. It doesn't work in particular for uh, small patients. So with the help from Dr. Dinault and the Montreal Hand Institute, um, we created the Swangans IQ catheter, where the lumen is located at 13 centimeters distal from the tip of the catheter. Um, so just a short story out there. Um, when we started working on this catheter, um, I remember that um, I went to one of the plants to talk to the engineers to say, OK, how we can actually add this lumen on the Swan uh, Gans catheter. And they said, yeah, we can do it. Um, I would like to take it for, to, to do some animal studies. Uh, but they asked me, OK, what would be the optimal location for this particular lumen? And I say, I don't know. Let me just talk to uh, Andre. I call him and say, hey, what do you think is the optimal location? He said, well, probably between 12 and 13 centimeters. But 13 centimeters looks like an unlucky number. So go with 12. I said, OK. So I call them. They give me the catheter. We do an animal study. It works perfectly fine. And of course, later on, we actually did a formal study to figure out what was the optimal location. And it came out to be 12.5. So I was extremely impressed by doctors in all ability to predict that optimal location. Um, so let me close that parenthesis there. Uh, but then uh, with this new catheter, now that we can measure the right ventricular pressure waveform, um, we created multiple algorithms. And one of those algorithms is to do the waveform analysis of the right ventricular pressure to extract those features and display them on the, uh, on the cardiac monitor. Then we took the waveform, uh, the right ventricular pressure waveform, and then we create algorithms to calculate the continuous cardiac output. And, and then from the, the cardiac output from the right ventricular pressure waveform, then we fuse it with the mixed venous oxygen saturation, and we were able to predict global hypoperfusion. Right, so let me go with the first algorithm. So the main goal of this algorithm is to do waveform analysis to extract the clinical relevant right ventricular features to display in real time in the cardiac monitors. So some of those features that um, was presented before are the minimum diastole, the end diastole pressure, the max DPDT, the systole pressure, the pressure gradient. And what you, add, what you see on the right uh, are the RB pressure waveform, as well as the pulmonary artery pressure waveform, and the parameters that we derive from them. So now you can imagine all the research possibilities that you can do with this data um, to evaluate now not only the right ventricular pressure, but also the coupling with the pulmonary artery pressure waveform, as well as on the left side. 
Then over the last couple of years, we have collected data on more than 100 patients. And so if you're curious about the distributions of those particular features, um, these are the uh, specific distributions. And one of the questions that I have been asked um, several times is how do you actually validate those features? And how do you know, how, how you done any comparison between the features from the RV, from the Swang and Q catheter, and the uh, Millar catheter, those that are non-fluid filled? And the answer to that is we did multiple studies for the FDA submission where we did actually that comparison, in particular for uh, DPDT as well. And I want to tell you that the results are very good in terms of the bias and precision when you do the bland alman plots as well as the correlation. So the next algorithm, now you take the RB pressure waveform, and from that waveform, you, um, the, the goal is to calculate continuous cardiac output. So this algorithm is called RBCO. It takes us input the right ventricular pressure waveform, 10 seconds of that waveform, and then it outputs the flow, pulmonary artery flow and cardiac output, although the flow is not displayed in the monitor currently. And it takes us optional, the input of the intermittent cardiac output. So you actually see it on the right, the right ventricular pressure waveform on the top, and then you see the corresponding parameters. But this algorithm was developed using a state-of-the-art uh, deep learning methods. And I want you to bear with me in the next two slides. I'm gonna give you a very high-level overview of how it works because it's very complex but hopefully you will, you will understand the core basics of this. So the core of the algorithm is called an autoencoder. So what, what is an autoencoder? What it does is takes any input signal and it just condenses it into the main representation of the input. So they call it the latent space. But in late terms, what it means is, imagine that your input are pictures of dogs, cats, and in the latent representation, you train a neural network to actually condense that information. So if you can actually learn that it has four legs, it has a tail, has whiskers, you can think about that as your latent representation. Then you train the model to decode, based on that latent representation, the input that in this case will be the Mona Lisa. So the applications are infinite. In this particular case, you input a blur image of the Mona Lisa you learn the latent representation and then you decode it and you actually have a Mona Lisa that is very clean. You can also do interesting stuff because you can take the latent space representation, those main features, and you can start tweaking it. And you can generate, for instance, images like this where you have a mustache uh, on the Mona Lisa. And this has been also used on DG recognition where you actually input uh, digits between zero and nine, and you can actually decode that information. So the question is, why is this relevant to your algorithm, to the right ventricular cardiac output algorithm? Well, the question that we posed was, can we actually estimate pulmonary artery flow from the right ventricular pressure waveform? So in the example before, you have right ventricular pressure as your input, and your output is pulmonary artery flow. So what we did is we did multiple animal studies where we place a um, flow probe in the pulmonary artery, and we have the swan gans where we have the right ventricular pressure waveform. And then in the protocol, we change the preload, afterload, and contractility of the animal with the goal of creating variations in the pressure as well as variations in the cardiac output. And the question was, can we actually learn the flow from the RB pressure waveform. So you see, this is in blue on the right side, corresponds to the actual flow, pulmonary artery flow, and the black corresponds to the right ventricular pressure waveform. And these are the results. So you have right ventricular pressure waveform on the left, 10 seconds. We train a model, an autoencoder model, to learn to go from the right ventricular pressure waveform to the flow. And I want you to focus on, on, on the figure on, on the panel B. So you have the right ventricular pressure waveform in blue. And at the bottom, you see in blue is the actual flow 
and in black corresponds to the predicted flow. And I, when I saw this the first time, I was like, I couldn't sleep. Because this, is, this was extremely interesting that a network like this could actually learn the temporal structure of the flow. It actually knew when the, harp, when the valve was open and closing. So that was extremely interesting. And we have hope to actually calculate cardiac output. So then in panel A, you see the right ventricular pressure waveform on the top in blue. And then the second subplot you have in black if you integrate the pulmonary artery flow, you calculate uh, cardiac output. If you integrate the flow from our pre uh, the predicted flow, you get cardiac output from the outer encoder, and in red corresponds to the thermal dilution cardiac output measurements. And then we do an, a bland alman plot, and the, um, and the results where we actually compare the, 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 the flow probe with the outer encoder, the flow probe with the thermal dilution and the thermal dilution with the out encoder. And you see that we have very small bias and very small precision. The next question is, well, you learn this in animals. How do you actually transfer this to humans? So that was very challenging. So step one was what I just explained. RB pressure wave on animal. You have a model that was trained in animals. You get the predicted flow. Then the next step was, okay, what if we actually take the right ventricular pressure waveform that we have in humans and we use the animal the model to have a surrogate human flow? But we know that from the temporal structure, it looks like flow, but if you integrate, it doesn't, have, it doesn't match your cardiac output that you did from thermal dilution. So what we did is we actually scaled that flow to match your cardiac output. And then we retrain another model where now you input RBP uh, in human and you have the predictive flow that was corrected. And that was the out encoder model. So the, how does it look like in, in the, in the, for the whole algorithm? So I already explained the top part. You have right ventricular pressure waveform goes into the out encoder model. You, the output is flow. You integrate the flow, you get the cardiac output. We call it the cardiac output from the out encoder. And then at the bottom, what we did is we actually train another model to learn the delta changes on the right ventricular pressure features with the delta changes in cardiac output. So let's say a change of 10 millimeters of mercury on the systolic, what will be the delta change on the corresponding cardiac output? And we call that the cardiac output linear regression. And then if you fuse these two particular measurements in a way that you take into account the, the noise, then you get the right ventricular cardiac output. Now, the dashed line here corresponds, if you have cardiac output from thermal dilution, you can also, the algorithm can actually consume that information to improve, but it's not a requirement. So these are the results. Um, we did validation across multiple sites, multiple cardiac outputs, um, we covered a wide range of cardiac outputs all the way from two to close to 20. Uh, we have uh, around 400 patients and more than um, 1,500 uh, thermal dilution cardiac outputs because that's our reference that we want to compare against. And then we have patients all the way from different um, conditions and procedures as well. So this is an example of our liver transplant case. On the top is the right ventricular pressure waveform. The second subplot, you have the black squares corresponds to the average of the thermal dilution cardiac output. If you do two or three ICO boluses, that will be the average. And then you have in orange and blue. So the orange is if you only use the first ICO measurement just to, as an input to your algorithm. And the blue never uses uh, information from the thermal dilution cardiac output. And then at the bottom, we have the pulse rate. Um, so what is important here is you can actually see how the algorithm um, tracks the changes in cardiac output as well as the absolute values. It goes all the way from 5 to 10 to 15 through the different um, phases of the procedure as well. Then if you do a bland almond on the results, you have a bias of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and a percent precision between 17 and 20%. As a reference, our acceptance criterion 
criteria is a bias between minus 0 0.6 to 0 0.6 liters per minute and a percent precision less than 20.2%. Now that we have the cardiac output from the right ventricular pressure waveform, what we did is we actually mix, uh, we use that information with the mixed venous oxygen saturation to predict global hypoperfusion. But what is, what is global hypoperfusion? For our case, we define it as when mixed venous oxygen saturation drops below 60% for at least one minute. So those two are the input to our algorithm. Then we generate historical and statistical features. We input that into a logistic regression model. Then we put some heuristics and then we display a value and this is validated across 490 patients at different clinical sites, and we achieve a sensitivity of 72% and a specificity of 92% in predicting that global hypoperfusion 10 to 15 minutes in advance. So this is an example where you actually see a drop on the mixed venous oxygen saturation. Um, then you have uh, cardiac output decreasing as well, and then the global hypoperfusion index algorithm alarms 12 minutes before the desaturation. So what is next? Um, well, the first step is to increase the awareness of right ventricular pressure monitoring. Now we know what the importance of RV monitoring and how, and give you the tools to actually help assessing right ventricular function. Um, the second step is to find what of, which, which are those RBP features that are related to uh, the detection of right ventricular dysfunction, and then identify the underlying etiologies of RV dysfunction. So with this, I want to thank you and open to any questions.